Before starting, maybe just to set context, we spent the last three Mondays going through the, the list of the different dispensations, some of the different covenants, um, some of the contrast between the, the, the way things were to be done under the time of the law in the Old Testament and now in the Day of Grace. Last time we started with a couple of errors in the interpretation with people who teach covenant theology. Thankfully, most of us have been spared from having to face it directly from the time, but others have faced it. And, and, and these are things that we do face when we come into contact with different believers. This weekend, some of us from the gathering here in Quito spent four hours with uh, different ones in a Quechua congregation. The Quechuas, they say Quechua in Ecuador, Quechua in Peru and Bolivia, for the descendants of the Incas. And these are the very far northern part of the ex-Inca empire. Number of really dear believers, um, they get together, they can have a hundred maybe or so people. And it's a fairly young congregation. But the reality is there's a lot of things that, that would be characteristic of the way they meet and understand that really are from the Old Testament, not from the New Testament. Not, and thankfully, one of the last things that some of the responsible ones said, please come back as often as you can to um, help teach us from the Word of God. So these subjects, even though we may be clear ourselves, are things that need to be shared with others within the body of Christ as we have opportunity. Important to just a, a phrase that's at the bottom of the screen, a text taken out of context can be a pretext. There's so many times where something is read, not understood in which dispensation it applies and then confusion is caused. And so um, the last time we talked about the sons of Abraham, how uh, none of us will ever, we weren't born as Jews, we'll never be Jews. Uh, those who are part of the 10 lost tribes don't know who they are now, so someone can't identify themselves as that. We will not in the future, if we weren't born into that, we will and not identify it as that. Well, none of us will know if we're believers because we're gonna be gone. And those who might come as a descendant of one of the 10 tribes, I believe would find that out when we get to the glory at the rapture. Uh, there is a sense of being sons of Abraham as those representing all who are saved by faith. And the other thing that we talked about very briefly last time, that the promise to bless the Gentiles in the Old Testament that will be something, that particular promise to occur with those who would be saved in the gospel of the kingdom. Some try to mix the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached during the tribulation with the gospel of grace preached today. So we looked at that. And then the last time we started, and I have one of the verses still in Spanish because this was modified from Spanish, but physical or spiritual circumcision. Um, the Jews we know uh, had a physical circumcision, the males. It was to be done the eighth day, and I think it's interesting, God in his perfect uh, ways of doing things. Doctors who have studied it, men or women doctors who have studied it have said that on the eighth day for a newborn baby is a day that typically is there, there's the least bleeding, but it, it says, in the Old Testament, that they were to be circumcised. It was a recognition and outward cutting off of the flesh. Um, but the New Testament is different for us. Colossians 2.11, in whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's a question of dealing with our flesh. Uh, what a horrible thing it is. What a daily battle it, it is for many of us. Um, but the question, and there's nothing wrong with the operation, but it's not required. Uh, but the instruction is for every believer to have the spiritual circumcision. Philippians 3.3, 3, was it something just for the Jews? No, it says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Someone said one of the first and key lessons every believer needs to learn, and it's something uh, that... We have to learn practically until we're taken out of the scene, until we're raptured, the flesh profiteth nothing. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and then 28 and 29. 
Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and maketh thy I boast of God and knoweth as well and approveth of the things which are more excellent being instructed out of the law. But he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither he that is one that is circumcised who is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew, one that is inwardly, and circumcision is out of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. An Orthodox Jew today is still trying to fulfill the law, still trying to do these outward things instead of recognizing that what God is requiring and asking of a Jew is that they believe on the same Lord and Savior that, that those of us who are Gentiles who have been saved by grace believe on. And so uh, doing all the outward things doesn't do anything to change the inside. There are, are rabbis that get together when every new technology comes along, whether it be a cell phone or a PC or, or whatever it is, and they go back and try to see how to apply the usage of that, how to apply the law to the usage of that, not realizing that Christ came, fulfilled the law, and opened the day of grace, the dispensation of which we live. Galatians 5, 15 and 16. For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the house of Israel. And so people who are under the covenant try to put themselves under the covenants today, and there are no covenants in, in effect at this point in time uh, for direct application to us. We live with some of the results of it, like no more destruction of the world by flood. Um, they, they go back and try to apply these things today as a physical thing. And then one of the greatest confusions We've talked about it before, but go back over it, is that the new covenant is with the church. That's what they're trying to teach. They're trying to spiritualize when it says Israel or Judah. Read the verses again, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Judah and with the, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that's exactly what's repeated in the New Testament. And so if someone tries to say they're under the new covenant, they better have proof that they are a descendant of one of the 12 tribes, either the 10 tribes of Israel, the two tribes of Jude, Jude and Benjamin. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So a couple of major changes. When we read in Deuteronomy 29, how they could go through the desert 40 years and not need to replace their shoes, not need to replace their clothes. They lasted that long. Wouldn't be very good business today for the people in the um, manufacturing and sale of clothing and shoes. But God in his, his infinite ability made those things last for 40 years, and they didn't even recognize it. Why? In many cases, because it was not written in their hearts. And so what's future will have two characteristics for them. One, it'll be on the inward part of them it'll be real it'll have reached their heart produced true repentance and faith and the second thing is that those of the 12 tribes who go into the millennium every one of them will be real the ones who are going to feign obedience the ones who are going to unite with satan at the end are going to be gentiles who have feigned obedience but they were not real and so sometimes there's been the confusion, and we saw this before, but just to go through these, to be clear, Matthew 26, 27, and 28, and he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So some people have said the New Testament or the New Covenant there means we're under it. No, the, the question is this, the same blood which washed our sins away is what will wash the sins away of those who believe in the future after we're gone. And so we are brought into blessing by the same work, but it does not mean 
We're under the same covenant. We're not under covenants. Second Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And so, again, this has been sometimes misapplied to say, well, if we're, we minister of it, we're under it. No, we, God has revealed to us things in the past, things in the present, and what will happen in the future. And so we can look forward. We can explain from God's word many things about what's going to happen in the future without being under the same covenant. Hebrews 8, 7 to 12. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been fought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant, and we've read this, but I'll go on. And in the end, in verse 11, they shall teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And so when someone tries to say it's with the church, when we've seen it multiple times, it's clearly with Israel and Judah. It, it, the key thing is it comes with a change of heart. God's looking for what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. And so in Hebrews 10, 8, 9, and above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sins, thou wouldest not. Neither had pleasure therein, for they are offered by the law. And he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And he taketh away the first. He may establish the second. Marvelous thing that the Lord Jesus did. All those sacrifices were in anticipation. They could never wash one sin away. They were in anticipation of the sacrifice, of the perfect sacrifice when the eternal son of God became a man, gave his life for us. So it says in Hebrews 10, 14 to 18, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with him. After those days, saith the Lord. So I will put my law into their hearts and their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Sins are forgiven. The sins even in the Old Testament were not forgiven because blood was, of those animals was shed. Wonderful when it was done in obedience and in faith. But it was all looking forward to the day when our blessed Savior gave his life, was the one who really bore our sins on Calvary's cross. Then another one that's sometimes been a confusion in different circles is that the outpouring of the Spirit promised in the Old Testament has been fulfilled in the church. Um, Romans 5.5, 5, And help maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And so, yes, we've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. It's the earnest of our salvation. It's the Holy Spirit being given to us as God's guarantee. Um, the that we really do have salvation, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Um, but and it also says in Romans 8, 23, and not only these, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I've just got a note on the screen, which uh, once the PowerPoint after you're sure, sure welcome to it, to go back to the verses, but what's sometimes called a law of double reference. There were, pro, there were there have been pro, partial prophecy fulfillments that have taken place and things that will happen uh, in the future. And what happens today is when people try to spiritualize something that's physical, they, they miss the point and then they, they, there becomes confusion because some will say, well, we're already in the the tribulation or the millennium. And so there are going to be a, a physical temple in the tribulation. There's going to be a, another physical temple in the millennium. Uh, but they have not been built at, at this point in time. Not the, not the temples that were built in the last one, Herod's temple, which was destroyed in 8070. There are temples in the future. So when people try to put us in the wrong time period, what happens is they uh, spiritualize things that are physical. Joel 2.20, for I will remove far 
off from you, the Northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face also toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he had done great things. So there are going to be the seven battles of the indignation, ones of Armageddon before the Lord's coming, the battles after that, starting with the king of the south, the king of the north, uh, those from the Roman Empire coming, the, um, the different battles that will occur. And each one of those enemies will be defeated, but they have not been physically defeated yet. Joel 2, 28 to 31. It shall come to pass after I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids of those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of, of smoke. The sun turned into day and the moon turned into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. We haven't seen that yet. We're not going to be here to see it. In the, when what's going to happen with things after we're gone, we're in the glory before we come back with the Lord. Same book, Joel chapter 3, verse 16 and 7. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. The Lord shall be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, and shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall be no strangers pass through her anymore. So the Lord will do this when he comes back with us. He is going to take absolute control in this world. As it's been said many times, in the day in which we live, and since Adam and Eve, unrighteousness has reigned. There have been restrictions on it and things, but we live in an unrighteous world, and if we expect something else, we're going to be disappointed until uh, the Lord comes and reigns on first and then over the earth with us for a thousand years. When that happens, righteousness will reign. Open sin will be cut off the next morning. Um, there will not be unjust court systems. There will not be um, all the things that plague the world so badly today. And then things will look forward to the eternity when righteousness will dwell. All sin, all evil will be confined to the lake of fire. But what it tells about in Joel chapter 3, 16 and 17 has not happened yet. And then in Acts uh, 2, 14, 1421, I'll just read the first part of it because it's a, uh, a repeat of the prophecy that was in Joel. But Peter stood standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, um, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing that it's but the third hour of the day. But this was, that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And... Um, We'll go ahead and read it because it's important to see what was partially fulfilled. And it shall come to pass in those days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out these days, in those days, my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The day shall be turned into darkness. The moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass. But whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. What was the partial fulfillment? If you see the list in Acts chapter 2, I think if you count them, it's from 17 different places that's mentioned there. And they did. Uh, those who were there, and then you'll get the same uh, with later with Gentiles and Samaritans, maybe Acts 10 and 18, something like that. Uh, God was forming one body. He did not form and trace different bodies. Lord's body, spiritual body, on simultaneously so that it would not be divided into three that way. He overcame, caused the effect of the Tower of Babel, for those who were present, and then some later, to overcome the effect of the division of languages. People were speaking languages that they had not studied, people were interpreting those to say what was said, different from what we see in the tongues movement today. Um, so there was an 
an undoing of some limitations, but the full fulfillment of this had not taken place and will take place in the future. And then another one is that the uh, temple that the Lord had prophesied in the Old Testament has been constructed spiritually in the church. Well, there is, as we have in two different books, I think the verses are on the next slide. There is the temple as a spiritual thing. So many times people in, in lack of understanding saying, I'm, I'm going to the temple instead of realizing that we are the temple today. Um, and there's a sense in which temple of the Holy Spirit individually and collectively, the, the future temple will be built, one in unbelief during the tribulation, uh, sadly to be used in the last half of the tribulation as a place to worship the beast. It destroyed, temple will be built. The details from Ezekiel chapter 40 on for during the millennium, and that will be, and I can put it this way, an authorized temple. Zechariah 6, 12 to 15, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear his glory, shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall both of them, and the crown shall be to Helam and to, uh, to Abijah and to Jedidiah and to Hen, the son of Jephaniah, for memorial, the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build the temple of the Lord. You shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. It's interesting. It says those that are far off. If you can imagine in the temples built Solomon's temple, or when the remnant came back and uh, from captivity in Babylon and built a simpler temple, if there had been Gentiles involved, it would have been considered something that was sacrilegious. But this temple in the future will include Gentiles in the builders. Ezekiel 43, 47, and the glory of the Lord came by the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house and the man stood beside me. He said unto me, son of man, in the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall be the house of God no more. Shall the house of God Israel no more defile neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Well, there's no throne today, so if someone tries to say that the Son of Man is sitting on a throne in a temple um, and tries to spiritualize that instead of recognizing that it's something physical for the future, it's a, an erroneous doctrine. And so some try to say that it's been constructed spiritually in the church. Um, well, what do we see today? In Acts 17, 24, God that hath made the world and all things are in, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What a restriction there was in comparison, first in the tabernacle, and then in the temple when they were then into the promised land. And the holiest of holies in that time until the veil was rent could only be entered one time a year by the high priest. Now the access to us is 24-7. So what has he done? First Peter 2, 4 and 5, to whom coming is unto living stone, disallowed even of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living stones are built up into a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable by God to Jesus Christ. And that day I will, in Acts Amos 9, 11, and 12, and that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. And so it's fallen, the temples were destroyed, but there's a promise for the future. Acts 15. Uh, 15 and 18, and to this agreed the words of the prophet as is written, after this I will return and build again the temple of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, 
that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name was called, saith the Lord, that doeth all these things, known unto God are his works from the beginning of the world. The stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner, Psalms 118.22. And so there is going to be, as we know, an earthly people. The earthly people will have access to a physical temple. The physical temple will have a, will be accessible not only to those who are from the 12 tribes, but also to Gentiles, those who have been saved by the gospel, the kingdom and the tribulation and enter the millennium. And so now there's others that try to say that the church is now the millennial reign, millennial reign of Christ. And um, Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Um, 1 John 3, 2, beloved, now we are the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and the dust shall be the, the servant's meat. They shall not hurt and nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. I've been to different zoos in different places. I've never seen the zookeepers put wolves and lambs together in the same cage. It wouldn't work now. It will work in that time. And so again, when there's an attempt to force something out of its time, out of its place, um, there is sometimes in the air of covenant theology, um, trying to spiritualize something that's physical. Luke 17, 20 and 21, it was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the king, uh, kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here, for there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If we recognize, for instance, the kingdom of heaven today, what is it? It's not the, the millennial reign of Christ. It's the fact that the king the lord jesus was rejected he's reigning in exile from heaven we recognize his authority and those who are in the kingdom of heaven do even though he's not reigning on earth just as sometimes earthly leaders have been forced to reign in exile he's reigning from heaven he should have that place in our heart we should recognize his authority above all earthly authorities we obey Earthly authorities, we should, when they don't go in, con in contrast and contrary to the word of God. Revelation 24 to 7, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worship the beast, neither his image, neither it is mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on the second. Death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. I don't know of a single person who tries to teach this, who says that uh, death has no power over them. That would be a, a false thing. Questions about misapplication of time. The, um, some believers today and professing believers are trying to say that if you get a vaccination for COVID, that it's going to be the mark of the beast. Well, number one, <laughs> man doesn't know, we don't know who the beast is. It won't be revealed until after we're taken out of here. The second thing is the mark of the beast has to be in the forehead or in what is the left hand. If you know, there are absolute microscopic, practically RFID chips, but if they get into the bloodstream, you're not going to make be able to make them stop in the forehead or in the hand. And so people need to be very careful about making these claims which have no real basis. And so those are just some of the air things. I want to go just read a verse um, and then go through a little bit of a summary. Brother Drago said, had asked that in a, in a and uh, maybe some of the subjects just to go back over them before we finish. Colossians 1, 24 to 27, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I have made a minister according to the dispensation 
of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you and the hope of glory. The full revelation that God is going to allow for a man on earth was given uh, when those things were revealed, the mystery, what was hidden before, what's been revealed now. Um, we live in a time where we, if we're open to it, have access to the greatest amount of light, the Spirit of God dwelling within. Uh, we look back on the finished work of Christ. We look forward to perhaps this very day being raptured out of here. Um, uh, we're not living under some covenant, under some law. We're living as those who are going to be united as the bride of Christ. What a wonderful privilege for us to do that. It certainly doesn't make sense to try to go backward and apply what applies to someone else to ourselves. So just in summary, you may say, well, why is this uh, picture here? I said, I wrote, when was the last time Akel told you what she was thinking? Um, sometimes there's, there's the question, well, why, where, where's all this coming from? If you were to go through these major religions of the world, um, a Hindu, for instance, believes that a cow is a sacred animal. I don't remember for sure if it was the book I read years ago. I think it might have been The Death of a Guru. A, a guru in India said, well, I really want to understand what my God is thinking. So he stood there and spent a long time face to face with a cow trying to grasp what, what the message might be until the cow charged him. And he said, if that's my God, I don't want him. And the man got saved. What's been revealed to us is incredible. A Hindu thinking that some figure or some animal is a god. <laughs> How could they ever know what that god is thinking if it, they don't? They're not gods. Uh, Muslim, they say that God really can't be known. And they, they can't have any assurance of anything until after death. Uh, a Buddhist, Buddha's dead, didn't rise again. Just he said, you need to extinguish all desire. Uh, I'm going to say... A fat chance at being able to do that. The human being was not made to extinguish desires. We should have our desires formed by the word of God, work of the spirit, the new life we have in Christ. Um, and so God, why did God reveal all these things in the past, these things in the future to us? Because it's his desire that we know what's his will. I just made some summary notes. Now we saw at the beginning dispensations are the administration of God over in a specific time frame. Started in innocence, the land and the kingdom. The two well, it's principal ones between that are when the dispensation, when they were under the law and art, the dispensation of the day of grace in which we're living. God administers things in, in different ways uh, over specific time frames, although certain principles don't change. But covenants, or agreements they can be conditional or unconditional and they they have direct application in some cases over more than a specific time period Noah was promised after the flood that times and seasons would be fixed it was promised that uh the earth would not be destroyed by um by a flood again uh adam and eve in the garden were told to fr be fruitful and multiply that they had administration over the earth that is still applicable to us today, although we're not under some covenant. Um, but so they deal with many aspects of life from having a family to the weather, to temple, to the land holdings, the Palestinian covenant said that Israel would be extended to the, will be extended to the river Euphrates with the mass influx that there will be of Jews, even though many will be cut off during the tribulation. And then uh, after Christ's return, the lost tribes identified many back in the land. They will need much more land. Their size of Israel is going to grow dramatically during that time. And so those covenants sometimes 
uh, were things at a specific period in the past, but some of them stretch into the future, promises of the descendants of David to be on the throne in the future. So distinct to dispensations are not limited to one time period. Put a verse there uh, in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. Having made unto you the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the question has been, well, how did God work over time? Well, he's revealed it. He's shown us the, the book of the Bible. The Bible is a book written in uh, divinely, but it's written in time and space. Individuals, we find out about them. We find, uh, in many cases, how long they lived, where they lived, what they did. Because it's, and God has promised and he's told us what's going to happen in the future in so many ways, in so many details. Why? Because he wants to share as part of his family with us his plans and his will. Sometimes we hear the term, and we haven't talked about it, but Judeo Christian, and I think that's an interesting term. It's interesting, it's important to know that the basis of blessing has never changed. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And the revelation of Jehovah in the Old Testament, we have the revelation of the full divinity, the full trinity now, clearly. Um, but sometimes the term Judeo-Christian is used. They don't say Hindu Christian, they don't say Muslim Christian, they don't say Buddhist Christian. Why Judeo-Christian? Well, the sense of it is that God's moral principles have not changed. His dealings in certain ways with mankind have but the basis of blessing has always been on faith. The moral principles of God have not changed. He's tested people in different times and different ways, but um, his, his moral principles have not changed. And so we will only do God's will when he's worked in our hearts. None of us can ever say, oh, it was because I was wiser. Uh, none of us chose to be born the first time and we recognized that when we've received new birth, again, it's God's grace and mercy to do it for us. And so even seeing the contrast between uh, Israel under the old covenant and under the new covenant, the difference is it's going to work in every one of their hearts, those who are going to be under the new covenant in the future. And so it's very important to understand that we only apply to us what's applicable to this generation, to this dispensation. The church is in the dispensation of grace. From the day of Pentecost until the rapture, there's no one who is under a covenant like that. The church is not under a covenant. The relationship is different. Be careful that we don't force uh, that. And when we have believers that we come into contact with who do have that confusion, maybe we might, with the word of God, be able to be a help. So if we don't see those differences, when sometimes people can say, oh, well, there's conflicts in the Bible. Well. Many of those conflicts that people try to point out are because they don't recognize, they don't rightly divide the word of truth, they don't recognize the differences in different dispensations. Through it all, in the last thing, God chose his faithfulness and human failure apart from him. So the dispensations, we remember it started in innocence from Adam's creation to the fall. As we said back when we went through that, a brother one time said he wondered if it even lasted a day. Our hearts are so so inclined to do what we're told not to do that Adam and Eve may have surrounded by the most incredible garden there's ever been, may have gone for the one place that they could not eat, and then they had to be banished from the garden. So then through the end of the flood, they, they, Adam and Eve started in innocence, they gained a conscience, we have a conscience today, um, that still applies, but they were under their conscience to govern them until the end of the flood. And then after they opened the ark and they came out from the end of the flood until Abraham was called, um, they were at the start of governments. I sometimes I've heard, well, dealing with something in Latin America for a while, where in one location there were several who were trying to say, well, you don't need to go to the, to be officially married, Adam and Eve didn't. Well. When they said that, they didn't really recognize that there was no civil registry at the time of Adam and Eve. Um, but once government was established, governments have authority. 
they can abuse that authority and they'll have to respond for that. But they do have a government an authority and we should recognize it unless it goes against the word of God. Then promise when Abraham was called until the law was given. And then very major dispensation from the giving of the law when they were down in the wilderness until the day of Pentecost. And we know we're in the time of the church from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. And then there's going to be, in a sense, a suspension of, of it because the church is going to be in heaven until the Lord comes back to reign for a thousand years. So we see these different ones. And then the covenants, we, the Edenic covenant, it was conditional. Adam and Eve were given responsibilities over the creation. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. They were told not to eat of one tree. They had to be banished from the garden because after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did gain a conscience, but they lost access to the garden. If they'd done that and eaten the tree of life, they'd be still around 6,000 years later. Can you imagine what their health situation would be? The Adamic covenant, the covenant that they would, Adam and Eve, they would have to deal Eve with specifically with the pain of childbirth and things. Adam and anyone working in agriculture, we know that there are weeds, there are diseases, there's insects, there's, there's all those difficulties. They didn't have to face that in the Garden of Eden with the promise that even though Satan would have influence, Christ would be finally victorious over that. The covenant to Noah, unconditional promise that there would be no more curse of the ground or universal flood. Times and seasons would be regulated. So we, that was given as in the, the Abrahamic covenant, unconditional promises to Abraham and his descendants. It's, uh, the promise was given complete fulfillment of it will take place after the manifestation of Christ when he comes back with us and Israel's territory will be extended to the Euphrates River, the Mosaic Covenant, Ten Commandments. They said, all you say for us to do, we'll do. They failed very miserably, just as we would under the same test. Other laws were given for Israel. Blessing dependent upon obedience and they failed the Palestinian covenant. Um, well, Abraham and I made a mistake there. It said blessing that would the promise of blessing by faith. The Palestinian covenant was unconditional. The promise to expand to the Euphrates River, the Davidic covenant unconditional. The descendant of David will sit on the throne. The throne will be reestablished during the millennium. Uh, the covenant to Solomon, two things. One of them was he would build a temple. That was unconditional. He did. And then the second was the descendant of Solomon sitting on the throne was conditional and he failed in that. A descendant of Solomon will not, will be through, if I remember correctly, Nathan. Then the new covenant, which we've talked about, and future promised Israel and Judah, blessings when there's a real change of heart. So Israel, under those, will there be regeneration? There'll be, have the Holy Spirit, a heart that's disposed to do the will of God, a relationship between God and his people. Universal knowledge of the Lord and Israel, sins forgiven and forgotten. Pro tremendous promises that are coming for them in the future. Um, and it's wonderful when there's a recognition, even today, of the place that they occupy in God's heart. So, uh, just say, you know, the a question came about you know, God's work with men and women over time, uh, He shared His purposes for us to be able to understand what's in his heart um, and we'll understand those things in a much much more full way just maybe we just commend ourselves to him in prayer and then if there's comments corrections observations please blessed god and father